We would like to take another moment to thank our sponsors, whose financial support helps make Cap Times Idea Fest the important event that it is. Special thanks to our presenting sponsor, UBS, the Burrish Group. They have been a major sponsor since the very first Idea Fest. Major sponsors include HealthX Ventures, Exact Sciences, and Quartz. Co-sponsors are Madison Gas and Electric, Godfrey and Kahn Law, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Epic. Our Friends of IdeaFest sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Madison Community Foundation, University Research Park, Cargo Coffee, Doc Smokehouse, and Forward Theater Company. Our media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal, Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Again, we thank you for your support and for making IdeaFest 2021 a huge success. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Murphy, Managing Editor of the Cap Times, and welcome to Cap Times Idea Fest. Glad to have you here, and I hope you've been enjoying the talk so far. I'm really looking forward to this one about what it takes to be a food and beverage entrepreneur now. I'm going to turn this over to our moderator, Lindsay Christians, in just a bit, but I'd like to take one moment to thank University Research Park, which is sponsoring this session. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> and my thanks to all of you for being here. We really appreciate it. If you're looking for ways to, to further support the Cap Times, I hope you'll cons consider becoming a member if you're not already. You can find information about that at membership.captimes.com. One bit of housekeeping before we get started. You're welcome to submit questions to the panel, but please do so using the note cards that our volunteers have. Uh, they'll bring them up to Lindsay, and she'll work them in as time allows. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay, who gets special thanks for putting this panel together. She's our food editor at the Cap Times, where she hosts a periodic podcast called The Corner Table about food and drink in Madison. She's also the author of the forthcoming book, Madison Chefs, Stories of Food, Farms, and People. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Chris, behind me. Um, I don't have my phone out here with me, and I don't have a watch on, so if somebody can give me maybe a heads up when it's, we're about 45 minutes in, that way I can open it up for questions. So first of all, thank you everybody for being here. I'm gonna have you all introduce yourselves in just a minute. But I wanted to frame this a little bit. We were sort of talking backstage in the green room about why I wanted to do this panel, uh, why I wanted to do it now. And part of the reason is I really wanted to talk about some things that are positive, right? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of things at Cap Times Idea Fest every year that have to do with problems that we're trying to fix, right? And that's, that's completely valid, and it's a good thing to be talking about. It's where we need to be putting our ideological energy. But I also love looking at solutions and things that are working and looking at why they're working and how because one of the things that I've noticed in my reporting is that everybody's story is different. People are coming from different places. They're coming from not only different pools of resources, right, but also different educational backgrounds and different motivations for why they want to do the things they're doing, make the moves that they're making. So I think it's actually kind of perfect that this panel followed the last one about the future of work. I think that's a beautiful dovetail, actually, mm -hmm. because we were talking a lot in that panel about how, how w workers' relationships to their employers are changing, but also about how employees are empowering themselves and making different choices and uh, making new paths for themselves. So. Um, I'm just going to sort of start here. Uh, Brad, you are the furthest from me. Yes. We can kind of walk it this way. If you want to just introduce yourself, tell folks a little bit about what you do. Mm -hmm. And if you make something, tell us what you make. Okay. All right. I'm Brad Rostowski. I'm with the food fin UW uh, uh, Systems Food Finance Institute, but, uh, the IBE, the in Institute for Business and Entrepreneurship. I've only been here for about a year. Um, so, and I run their fellows program. We have an accelerator program that we've run. I actually ran it for five years prior to that with Fab Wisconsin, a group out of an industry cluster group for the food and beverage industry um, to help businesses get, you know, get themselves set up for growth, all right? And then develop sales, marketing, operating plans, financial packages so they can get the funding they need for growth. And then we work with them, you know, once, once we get our hands on them, we usually never leave them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. 
Hi, I'm Ann Minson. I'm the creative director and co-owner of The Deliciouser, which is a local spice company here in Madison, Wisconsin. And we make, we um, hand blend and craft all of our spice blends here locally. Uh, I'm Billy Duplanty. I'm a co-founder and a sales director for Youngblood Beer Company. Uh, we make beer. <laughs> I make up a lot of names for the beer. I drink a lot of the beer and I make a lot of relationships. And I try and hang on to those as long as I can too. Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Jonathan Correa and I'm the founder and co-owner of La Cosecha Tortilla Company. <clears throat> uh, we make uh, tortillas, chips, and also corn nuts uh, using heirloom varieties of corn that are <clears throat> Grown by uh, different growers in, uh, across Mexico, as well as uh, some regional growers here in the, in, the, in the Midwest. Hi, my name is Harriet Gomez, and um, on my day job, I am an insurance producer, and I work for an insurance company. And then on my other job, I am a co-owner of Kirfatu Catering, which is a West African catering company. And I have four other partners that I work with, and um, we only do catering for now hoping to um, expand in the future. So Harriet, my first question is actually for you. <laughs> um, you started Care for Two in 2017? 2018. 2018. Yes. Um, and you run it with family, close friends? Yes. I was curious about when you were first getting started, how, how did you approach uh, finding the ingredients that you needed, for example, and also finding space and starting to get your name out? Um, when we started, it was easy, um, so we thought, uh, <laughs> because um, our parents, um, well, my partner's parents, so it's um, I'm partnership with four other guys. Um, two, of, two of them are brothers, the other two are brothers, the family's friends. And their mom's um, name is Fatu. So care in Wolof means um, house. So Fatu's house, that's how the name came, came about. It was really easy. So we were just having conversations amongst ourselves and say, hey, why can't we start a catering business? Because um, the parents have been cooking a lot for the community. Like they were like the OGs like, of the community, African community. <laughs> and they would you know, cook for um, ceremonies, events, I mean like all large events. So we just talk am amongst ourselves, can we start this business? It was easy, we already had a name. We not never thought about spaces or anything like that. It was more of like, okay, just outdoor events, focus on outdoor events. So we started and as we got to know people, I talked to the owner of Stock Eatery and I literally sat in a coffee shop when I was registering the business because we were months into it. In late 2017, so early 2018, we discovered that we weren't prepared for this. We weren't prepared at all. We weren't registered. We didn't even have a bank account. And I literally sat in the coffee shop and that's when we registered. We started backtracking and just fixing all the errors that um, we made. Oh, yeah. We hit a pause on it and then fix all those things, you know, before we could move forward. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, mean to, I, I just, I wanted to ask one more thing about that. Like, it seems to me like, there's gotta be a point where you're like, oh, wow, we weren't prepared. What was the thing that made you say, no, we really wanna do this, we're gonna keep going? Um, because we knew that we had a, um, a market just based on, um, you know, in the past when our parents will cook and things like that. And then we did the African Fest a couple of times where um, the crowd was really, really large. And you always have people encouraging you, oh, maybe you can do this, maybe you can start a business. And then we thought about amongst ourselves, maybe we can do this, you know? And um, once we went in, like somebody said in the green room, like when you fly, you can um, put your feet on the ground, you just have to keep going. Uh, jump off the diving board and you hit the water, you still got to kick your feet. Yeah. <laughs> There's no stopping. Yeah. We were like that. Um, we already started. We we're like, okay, there's no point in stopping now. We can pause and fix um, the issues we're having, but we just got to keep going. All right. So, Jonathan, when I spoke with you several months ago, I thought to myself, I don't think I've ever heard anybody this passionate about corn. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. So I guess one of my questions for you would be, why are you so passionate about corn? Why did you want to start this project? Um, 
well, I'm trying to keep that kind of simple because it's kind of it's a it's a broad it's a broad thing for me. But um, uh, the reason why it's so important to me is because um, this whole process of starting this business has been a way of reconnecting with uh, my culture and, and lost pieces. Because my grandparents on my on my father's side, or great grandparents on my father's side, came from Mexico, and my mom's side, um, Italy and Germany. Mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, early 1900s, and there's a lot of, a lot of traditions, a lot of things that have been have been lost over that time. And as a as a cook, we we express ourselves through food. Mm. And so um, the reason why I'm so passionate about corn is because the more you dive into each variety, you start to see their 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 intricate stories, whether where it's from, the texture of the tortilla, the texture of the chip that it makes. Um, and there's just there's just so much rich history in those in those individual seeds, and um, it's just it, it's it just brings me a lot of joy to learn those stories and to and to understand the the different varieties and where they come from, how they taste, and how they can bring joy and nutrition to people. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Billy, I, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about Young Blood's growth, um, which from the outside has been pretty quick. Um, you uh, And I wonder if you can maybe talk a little bit about the ways that Youngblood has grown since it started and how you've managed that growth. Um, so we started uh, last May, um, possibly the worst time to open a brewery since uh, Prohibition, <laughs> maybe. Uh, and uh, like I said, when you we were too far in, and when you jump off the diving board, you still got to get your feet kicking into the edge of the pool. So that was kind of the we, we had people literally leave their jobs to join us on this like new venture, and we were just like, okay, well, um, tap room can't be open. Uh, we need to figure out a way around this. We, I had this whole romantic idea where I'd be like loading up a van with 15 quarter barrels a week and just driving around and not coming back till they're all gone, and that's my week's work, 15 quarter barrels. <laughs> Woo! And uh, then that turned into... Uh, a way bigger thing than that because <laughs> when the tap room can't pour any beer, we literally, um, and the, the, the way we were able to, you know, expand so quickly is um, the pivot of our entire staff when we opened to understanding what was going on mm -hmm. and like putting their heads down and doing whatever they could do to make us viable. So we had to start putting beer into cans. That was never part of the idea, um, at least for like five years, we were not going to do that. Um, so literally, when we started, we, uh, we would have beer pouring off the tap lines. We'd have somebody um, dipping the cans in a uh, um, solution to sterilize the cans. Then we'd have them purge it with CO2. There'd be like our whole staff there just chain ganging this whole entire process for 10 barrel batches of beer. It was awful. But <laughs> it, I mean, we're all like super close now. And we're all, I mean, it was kind of a straight up one team, one dream thing, but we, we worked and worked and worked. Uh, and I had a lot of connections before this, so I had places to sell it. So I would be out three days a week selling it and then two days a week delivering it. And um, yeah, it was, it was just a lot of hard work, a lot of pivoting, just yeah. keep changing. We couldn't just, if we stayed on our uh, initial trajectory and what we wanted to do, we would never have even, you know, we would never have opened our doors. So yeah. You said you had contacts from before. Are you talking about like retail, like places where you would sell the cans? Or? Yeah, so I've been in beer for, uh, this is my 16th year. Um, so I've been in it since like before I could drink, really. And uh, I was a merchandiser, I was a salesperson, um, and then uh, with distributors, then I jumped from that to a uh, craft beer kind of a broker. And uh, I basically was paid a little bit of money by a handful of different breweries to be a full-time rep for them. And so I made a ton of connections. And so I... When we were launching this thing, you know, I was already putting out the thing that we were like, hey, we're going to do this in draft. So I would be in Milwaukee selling beer um, and or I'd be at stores all day selling beer to stores. And then at night I'd drive to Milwaukee no matter what. And I'd sell to the bars because they were still open in Milwaukee. Oh, so it was right. it was uh, there's we made a beer called the Tale of Midnight Bill. And that's uh, literally I would have to send my uh, what what was all coming um, to be delivered the next day to Tom, my partner, because he had to build everything out. And he'd be like, uh, at 11 o'clock at night, he's like, uh, are you home now? Or does Midnight Bill ride again? And I'm like, it's Midnight Bill time. I got like, I'm so far away from home. I've got so many places yet to hit. So I'd stay out till past midnight making sales calls. And that's, that's how we survived it. That's how we continue to grow. Honestly, we have great relationships still. So 
Um, and now we're with some distributors, which really help a lot. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, people have all kinds of feelings about distributors and their role, but... I did when it, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for them for 12 years, and I was like, I do not want to work for a distributor. And then right. yeah. uh, about one month in, I was like, we need to start looking at some of these distributors. Yeah. <laughs> well, because, because they, make, they make the point, like, do you want to do the thing and make the thing, or do you want to drive it around to people? You know. Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> some, some of it's more fun than other stuff. Agreed. Um, so, Anne, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the Deliciouser team and how all of your skills work together, like what roles each of you has. Sure. So we have a really diverse group of partners. Um, two of them are professional chefs with Lombardinos and the Old Fashioned, so a huge culinary background. They're kind of our seasoned veterans um, for working in the food industry, so they really help kind of curate um, the blends themselves. Patrick O'Halloran, who is the chef at Lombardinos, he is making all of the recipes and blending them and grinding them literally from stage one. Um, the rest of us, we kind of use our different backgrounds. So I actually work in higher education. I'm a policy analyst right on campus. Um, I'm also a graduate student, so I have maybe seven jobs. <laughs> um, so I utilize those skills from a project management perspective. So really making sure that we're thinking about data analytics. Um, how is everything coming in? How does it look like projecting you know, every single month? Um, but then also building with connections. I think one of our successes is really, again, leveraging the people that we know in the industry because we have some partners who are really seasoned veterans. Um, and they have really come to bat for us as far as giving us good advice, introducing us to other people. Um, but at the end of the day, those backgrounds, again, really help us be successful, but we're also a family. Um, so Patrick is my future father-in-law, Michelle is his wife, and Marsha is actually Patrick's ex-wife. Um, <laughs> so we really like to play on this idea of an actual blended family, blending spices. Oh. Um, and that really works for us. We're all very close. We kind of quarantined together throughout the pandemic. Wow. Um, and we also started last year. So being kind of isolated for a year and a half really inspired us to cook together. And that's really kind of the inception of this idea really came from. Yeah. Well, it also strikes me that, you know, the chefs that I have known are often, uh, they work a lot. They yes. like to work a lot. They're used to being very busy. Not only being very busy, but also being very in charge. Um, so I, I can imagine that like having this sort of gap of like, okay, well, we're only doing takeout or in some cases we're not doing, we're, our restaurant's closed for a while and just looking around for, well, where, where is my passion actually? Like where are the things I really, things I really wanna do? Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting. I mean, so, Patrick, Michelle, and myself and my partner, we lived together when Lombardino's closed for about a month and a half. And it was really fun for us because um, if anyone lives with a chef, you know that they cook all day at the restaurant. So when they come home, they're not cooking anymore. Um, so it was a real treat that he was home all the time because I literally got some of the best meals of my life during that time. Um, and he was really... You know, for a couple of days, he was just kind of enjoying the relaxation and he got kind of antsy. And so he actually started a YouTube channel. Um, he wanted to connect with his customers. He missed them. Lombardinas has been a staple in the neighborhood for years. Um, and going into that dining room and seeing familiar faces was really hard not to have for him. So again, huge benefit. He started a cooking show in our kitchen, um, which <laughs> was amazing. It. But again, you know, that downtime, I think for him was, I still want to do this. Um, and so that's kind of when we started blending spices, you know, to just keep the blood going and keeping, you know, the ideas running. Yeah. There was also, I feel like there were issues too at the beginning of what you could get your hands on, you know, and, and being able to do it, a little bit of that yourself has got to be a boon, you know? So thanks. <laughs> uh, Brad, I'm hoping that you can shed a little bit of light around the larger context of what we're talking about here, which is... You know, I was reading stories as I was getting ready for this panel about just this boom in entrepreneurship that mm -hmm. we've seen in the past 18 months. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about maybe what you're seeing in terms of the larger context around entrepreneurs. Uh, well, in general, I tell you, I've been doing this now for six years, a little over six years working with entrepreneurs and whatnot. My, you know, having, I, my whole career has been mostly in big food. 
um, and was interesting. And then I spent five years with Fab Wisconsin, as I said earlier. And we, we would do a Farm Factory Fork event, you know, to te teach people about, you know, careers in food, you know, and their, how transportable they are. And, and I can remember a couple of years ago, we had a panel. We had Giacomo Faluca, who's the founder of Palermo's. We had uh, uh, Louis Gentine, who was uh, the, the third generation for Sargento. We had Truman McGee. I don't know if anybody knows Truman McGee from Milwaukee, but he is funky fresh spring rolls. He's an icon in Milwaukee. Um, and then we had Carry Ingredients. We had uh, one of the presidents of Carry Ingredients, and we had a panel, and we had literally 25 students get up and talk. And these are high school students. Mm. Every single question, all 25 were about how to start a business, not how to go, go what, what are you looking for in somebody at Sargento? What do you do at Palermo's or, you know, whatever. It was how to start your own business, mm. right? And I was, I was sort of like, I sat back like, wow, I, when I was that age, I wasn't thinking like that. I, I went from Ma Madison to Oscar Mayer to, to Sargento. I mean, so it was a totally different career path. Um, so the energy today is sort of inverted than when I grew up, all right? Um, so that's good. The other side of it, I came out five, six years ago, and there was a lot of an ecosystem developed for support. I didn't know of all of them. I mean, I never really even understood all the different associations, all the different resources, Kiva, um, you know, Kickstarter, um, just the things that people can do. I mean, they were, six years ago, they were, they were there, but they weren't as, as vibrant as they are today, and they continue to evolve. There's, I'd say, you know, corporate America has sort of started to outsource their innovation. So what they've done is they've started, you know, starting block and this, you know, this city has got a lot going on with it. I mean, a lot of support. And then there's a lot of entrepreneurs. I mean, what I, what I love about working with entrepreneurs, I was talking to these guys in the, in the green room, is that you get a room full of them together, the energy just goes off the charts, all right? And they share. Corporate America, they hide things, all right? Um, you know, and, uh, and when I got uh, two or three microbreweries in my first, my first cohort of companies, I, had, I think I had two microbreweries. Next one, I had another two. These guys got together. They didn't, there was no, you know, we do it, you know, there was 100% there was sharing. So, it, you know, the, the energy's there, you know. What I've been trying to do with, with, the, with, with FAB and now at the university is how do we sort of coach them. You know, I've been doing this for 35 plus years. My goal is to work with every, the companies I work with to have them get it done in three to five years, All right? So, because there's a lot of navigating that has to get done. And as you start, you know, it's one thing to start up and do what you've been doing, then start scaling it and getting more people involved and more people involved and needing more capital. So the, the you know, the, the system is out there. Now what we, you know, I always talk about, it's really quite simple. It's just not easy. You have to put all the pieces together, you know? Yeah. I, I feel like I remember Tara talking about this money, Tara Johnson, the yeah. former head of Food Finance Institute, talking about this point where you go from a hobby mm -hmm. to a business mm -hmm. and that there are like these pain points kind of on that journey. Yeah. Um, and I always find it fascinating because there are, you know, folks that I'm talking to now where I, I used to always say, well, you know, do you want to have a brick and mortar? Like when, when do you want to have your brick and mortar restaurant? Mm -hmm. Or when do you want to have this? And a lot of folks are saying, well, maybe I don't, mm -hmm. maybe that's not success for me. Mm -hmm. That's not what it looks like. But, you know, to your point as well, this, this idea of when we all do better, we all do better mm -hmm. or all boats all rise. Ships rise and rising. Yeah. yeah. That, that is so encouraging and inspiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me that we're in this kind of wonderful moment for food entrepreneurship where we're seeing all of these opportunities come and mm -hmm. people willing to share them for mm -hmm. sure. So actually, Harriet, my next question is for you. Um, when you think about what the next steps are for the, for the catering company and, and where you see it going, um, can you talk basically about like maybe what's immediately next and then maybe what some of your dreams are for it going, going forward. I mean, like the dream, of course, is to um, have a restaurant in the future. But um, I personally, I'm a realistic person. Um, every time my partner say, oh, yeah, we should um, open a restaurant because people are saying it, I just immediately tell them no. <laughs> no, no, no. Because, I mean, it's so easy just to say, okay, this is my dream. Let me just do that now versus like, can we do it now? Because every single one of us has, um, have a different job, have a day job. Um, I'm also a graduate student um, and I tell them, I cannot be in a restaurant 100% of the time. And when we're doing, when, when we're gonna say we're gonna open a restaurant, 
who is ready to quit their jobs right now and give it 100%? I mean, we have to be really real with ourselves. So um, a food card is uh, much more realistic. And then um, that's what we're trying to work towards in the future um, to possibly have a food card. But again, like there's a lot of like things, um, like challenges um, that I try to tell them. Okay, um, okay, who's gonna drive it? Not me. I'm not driving a food <laughs> car. <laughs> so you know, so tell me, you know, who is gonna be driving the food car? If I can have two people who's gonna um, say 100%, I'll drive the food cart. I mean, like, we can do that tomorrow. So those are just, like, things that I believe that if you're going to be going into uh, something that big, I don't want to make the big, um, same mistakes that we did um, prior to opening the business. Yeah. yeah. Has, would you say that one of the biggest challenges has been balancing time between your day jobs and the catering company, or are other challenges bigger than that? That has been, that has been rough, because um, <laughs> I have a family, I have a husband, I have two kids, um, 12 and 10 now, and I'm a full-time student, I work my other job full-time, and I also do this full-time. So, like Anne said, um, I have, you know, so many different jobs, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you're trying to balance that. Um, when I'm working my job, my phone is ringing. I'm on Zoom calls. I'm answering like emails. Mm. So my brain has been um, programmed to multitask. Um, perhaps I shouldn't have gone back to school. <laughs> <laughs> but I just felt like, oh, I still have some time. I can go back to school. Mm. But then I went in there and I'm like, what, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but I already started. I can't stop. And I still want to make sure everything that I'm doing, I'm successful at it. So that's, that's been, you know, balancing time has been like the um, biggest challenge. I'm really glad you're here today. <laughs> As you already know, I wasn't going to be here because we have an event going on right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have my change of outfit in my car. I can just like, you know, That's change amazing. my outfit. <laughs> I'm just right. really grateful for your time right now. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> Yeah, um, I wasn't going to miss it, so thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, I wanted to talk a little bit about your uh, your move coming up into the pasture and plenty, the PNP Make Shop. Yep. Um, I, I wonder if you can speak to what opportunities there have been or are, like what, what you were using as you sort of started the company, and what a move to a place like that means for you, why it's important and valuable. Um, so... Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of been a bumpy, a real bumpy ride for us. Um, so, you know, this is a concept I've been working on for a while. And initially, when I finally started making tortillas and started doing this, I was working with another partner who was trying to open up a restaurant, didn't know how to make tortillas. So we, we were trying to find a way to work together. And ultimately, that didn't work out very well. Um, and so we parted ways. But luckily, he still kept supporting me. I was able to rent the equipment that he had bought for the restaurant. You know, we found a, a kitchen space that someone was willing to lend to us, you know, for, for many months. Um, and so it's, for me, moving into the pasture and plenty space is just like, a, it's kind of a sigh of relief because we've been hand making uh, tortillas for the last, probably a, a little over a year, you know, now where we're making, where me and my business partner, Amy, making tens of thousands of tortillas by hand doing all making each individual tortilla for the chips so that we were what we've been making and selling and stuff like that so this is kind of what it means to me is like it's it's just a our next step in phase two of like starting to automate so we can actually start to scale up so we can start to actually pay ourselves hire an employee um and um so yeah it just it means a lot to me to have this opportunity to do that with her and she's just it, i can't say enough about christy she's just been so supportive and she didn't have to create this space for all these other entrepreneurs you know she was just trying to expand her own business but through that she was like well i could, she was fine trying to she found a way to support other people that were like me or trying to trying to get their their business going and trying to to grow so yeah in advance of this, I emailed Christy because <clears throat> she had hoped to open the PNP Make Shop um, this summer. She says they're now shooting for October 1st. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I also thought was interesting is that you were talking about 
maybe collaborating with some of the other small business owners that are going to be there as well, which I yeah. thought was very cool. Yeah. Uh, so one of the other uh, small businesses that is going to be starting there is uh, Milpa, and they make uh, they make uh, tamales and they also make uh, salsas and things like that. And so it's 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 really wonderful to be able to continue sharing that because we you know we had thought about maybe one day like have releasing a line of tamales and doing kind of growing our product line. Um, but then when I met Shannon and Miros, it was like, no, like I want to support them. They want to support us. So we're going to be supplying them with, uh, with the, the, the masa that they need for their tamales. And, um, yeah, it's really exciting to kind of to do that together. You know? Nice. And before I forget, um, do you do other, are you, you're a farmer as well. Are you not a farmer? Yeah. 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 Uh, this year I haven't, we haven't really been farming too much. We had our first daughter in December. So that, uh, that, and also trying to launch this business has been, it's been a lot. So we haven't really been farming a ton. We've done a little bit of growing, but yeah, we have a small farm. We do, um, originally started doing diverse produce. We were doing salad greens and other things like that. And, um, my partner, she's a herbalist, so she's growing all lots of different medicinal herbs for products that she's making. Um, and so now we're kind of transitioning to mostly focusing on uh, those medicinal herbs and the products that she's trying to create. And then um, uh, growing maybe one or two of varieties of corn for the tortilleria, as well as uh, some chilies and some other products because supply, we want to be able to supply and help uh, Milpa grow in their salsas and, and doing things like that. But we also have some other fun ideas that we want to play with, with some very interesting chili varieties that you, you'd have to go to South, deep into South America to find them. So we're, I'm excited to, to start working on that next year. So nice. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Billy, I, I wonder if it's different working in an alcohol related business than it is in maybe if you're making something that is not as regulated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think we're definitely a little bit more hindered than a lot of companies because we do have more hoops to jump through. But then once you get past that, we actually have probably a broader mm. range. Um, I mean, uh, Tom, um, my business partner, Tom Dufak, he, uh, he's the lead cat wrangler and he gets... He gets everything passed through every uh, system that it needs to be done. Kyle Gregory, she makes all our beer. And uh, after that whole process is done and everything is, uh, you know, governed by the state and everything is, you know, licensed properly, I can go anywhere. Uh, well, before we went with distro, I could literally go and just drop kegs off at any bar if they had a valid liquor license. So, like, we benefited huge from that. So, um Luckily, the industry is awesome, and everyone is like so giving with their with what they're doing. They're like, "Oh, you guys just opened. Cool. I don't have a lot of space to give you, but I'll at least take something." And a lot of a little bit is is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't really. Yeah, I don't think it's. Uh, I think it's harder on a lot of other people than it is us. Is Madison a hospitable place to start a small brewery? Absolutely. <laughs> this is a. Uh, I mean. We we borrowed kegs from Working Draft for God's sakes when we first started because we didn't have kegs, half barrel kegs because we only had uh, um, little quarter barrels that you could literally depressurize and throw and recycle. So like that's how we were getting beer out and uh, like we're like, hey, we need some like half barrels for the tap room for like the little bits of time that people do come in here. And they're like, yeah, sure, here's a handful of half barrels and they let us just borrow it. And it's the high tides raise all ships thing. Um, the brewing community is just. It's awesome. Um, and the restaurant community is awesome, too. So, like, we kind of benefit from both worlds um, a lot. But, uh, like, Eagle Park lent us their hand seamer for cans. So we wouldn't have even put beer out on time if it wasn't for Eagle Park giving us, a ha like, a can seamer so we could actually can beer. So, yeah, we, we, we benefit from a lot of good relationships. We, and it's not lost on us. Excellent. And when you were developing the brand identity for the Deliciouser, what kinds of things were inspiring to you? Where did you, where did you draw sort of both inspiration and what were you hoping to convey with that identity? Yeah, so we had a lot of fun. We actually spent months developing our brand identity. It was really important for us to stay consistent with our values. And so we actually worked with a local design firm here in Madison called Swink. Um, and they were incredibly kind to us. But basically, we wanted our brand, especially because we're an online retail product. We're selling things online. So our labeling and brand is everything to our customers. It's the first thing they see. 
Um, so we really inspired from our own experiences. A lot of people, um, how they store spices can be very frustrating. Um, I don't know if everyone has that same experience, but yeah. So for us, oh, yeah. when you open a spice drawer, you're oftentimes like rummaging through that drawer, flipping jars upside down, swiveling them around to figure out what you're looking for. So for us, our labels needed to be functional. Um, so we incorporated labels on the front. So if you're a spice rack, you know what you're looking for. Um, but if you're a drawer kind of person, you also have a label on the top. Um, so you're no longer rummaging. Um, and then there's also a lot of pops of color. Um, so that was really important for us. But then also a huge part of our values is supporting local. So our paper comes from Wausau. We work with a local printing company. Um, it's not always the most cost efficient, but to us, not compromising our values is super important. So everything is local. Um, so that's that's really important to us as far as our brand identity. That sounds like such a better system than what I did, which was just like take scotch tape or whatever and like put it on top <laughs> so I could tell what I was looking for. Um, but yeah, setting yourselves apart visually, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's a challenge, right? But it's a good challenge. It's a lot of fun to, to figure out, okay, what do we want people to think of when we see this? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about starting a spice company in Wisconsin is that there are some really well-known spice companies in Wisconsin. There are. Um, so <laughs> that was something interesting that we had to think about. And for full disclosure, I love Penzies. Yeah. Um, I use their Same. sunny Spain on everything. <laughs> so this is nothing like a competitive thing. But from a functional standpoint, like we really needed to think about, we're passionate about this product, how do we differentiate ourselves? And brand identity was really something that people told us about. And so creating a very sophisticated label and logos and concepts around that was really important to us to set ourselves apart. So if you were looking at a shelf and you saw Spice House, Penzies, and The Deliciouser, you were not kind of fading into them. You kind of stood out. And so again, we worked tirelessly on making sure that we were a vibrant amongst you know, all of these other Spice Houses. You're also doing some different blends that I have yeah. not found uh, with that, which again, I love, I love Penzi's very much too, but I don't think they're doing a sashimi to togarashi spice. No, and that's actually one that's really close to my heart. So I am actually South, from South Korea. And so we use gochugaru um, in our togarashi, which you can get togarashi spice, you know, from a couple different places, but one thing that we like to include is really playing around with those specific ingredients mm -hmm. and also honing in on our own culture, our own travel experiences, things that make it kind of more close to our heart. And so for that one in particular, I was very adamant to Patrick, no, we're using Korean chili flakes. <laughs> it tastes different if you yeah. don't. Like I, yeah, um, I, this is kind of a side story, but I was, I was working um, with the Morris Ramen folks on how they made their ramen, and they were trying different like ways of making the chili spice, and they said, well, we did this one version, but we used these kinds of chilies, and it tasted like Japanese pozole, which was not what they were going for at all, um, and it, it just, it, sa it starts to feel culturally kind of muddied um, if you're just looking for like X amount of heat. Well, it, it tastes different. Yeah. So. Um, oh. So, Brad, one of the questions that I had for you was when entrepreneurs maybe don't have access to traditional avenues of funding. Mm -hmm. So maybe they don't have a lot of generational wealth and can raise money from friends and family, which a lot mm -hmm. of entrepreneurs do, or they're not able to get loans from mm -hmm. banks in the same way. What kinds of advice do you give to those folks and what resources have you found are available? Like I said, there's there are a fair amount of resources available. I mean, there's the you know the Kiva. I don't I don't in Madison area. I think you get a Kiva office right now too. Yeah, I, I know there was one in Milwaukee. I wasn't sure for in Madison. Um, you know, in Kickstarter, there's there's different campaign levels that you can do now online that at least allow you access to capital that just didn't exist before. Mm. Then you got you know CD, CDFIs. I mean, you know, like Wibic and different groups like that that do lending um, for. For businesses, so I mean, there's there are outlets. You got to make sure you go. You got to establish relationships with them. You know, I, I, the, I guess the one thing, and I I'll, I, I'll, I might say it later, but it's like the one thing is have a plan, all right, mm -hmm. and then have a backup plan. You know, and I said, you know, and, and it's like, and, you know, I 
in, when I worked navigated corporate America, I always had back doors. I never went into a project with, without having options. Um, and you know, and I see the best entrepreneurs. I mean, some of them like say they're sort of like there's no plan B. You know, you just said jump. You know, but the you know you, the reality is is you're thinking about steps ahead. All right, and you got to plan steps ahead. You know, so that's number one. Have a plan, and then I think the other thing is this: is that start small. Start scaling. Start, you know, you know, farmers markets. I mean, people don't like to do it. You know, they don't want to do these markets. I mean, they don't like. It's a time commitment, whatever. No, you have to build. You're building your capability to make it, to sell it, to market it. you then the next step up is you start realizing what you know, what you're really good at, and then you and then you realize that you know I'm, I'm not good at that. And the just sales and distribution side of things. You know, you got to find somebody like you. I mean, it's like it's just you just need to have you have to acquire people. And, you know, as part of the team, you know, then, you know, they may not bring a lot of money, but they may bring access to another step of the process. I mean, this is all about building up your capability to do as a, as a business. All right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know Leonard Gentine, who founded Sargento. All right. He started out with a cheese counter. I mean, it was just a cheese counter in Elkhart Lake, you know, you know, just a, a one door type of thing, um, you know, and he built it, built it, built it. So it, it, there's a there's a sort of, you know, it's nice to have money behind you. I've worked with, the, the, you know, both on corporate America and with entrepreneurs that have access. Um, but spending m money wrong is a big mistake, you know, and, uh -huh. and I've seen it done at corporate where they've built plants and shut them down. And I've seen it done with, you know, smaller companies that get access to capital that they shouldn't get. They're not ready for it. You know, so the reality is, is building your capability to do is so much, almost more important than getting access to the money. Because um, if you don't, you get the money and you start, I have one company that built a brand. These people are great. And, uh, and I've used this as a case study, so I'll just before, it's, it's really good. And so they went to a creative person and these guys give 2% of the Fosse Foundation. Um, they went and, uh, went to a creative person to create a nice grilly goods package. And so it's an organic, raw, dense snack. And so they created this really cute gorilla package. Well, their target market was Jack and, and, and Janet, adventure, you know, hikers and bikers. All right, so these people want to conquer their world. They looked at that package and said, that's not for me. All right, they spent $10,000 wrong. All right, that film is sitting on the shelf, not being used. All right, so that's why I say, you know, having a plan, you know, Making sure you focus it, you know, you start out and you build what you can in front of you. Don't get too far ahead of yourself. And you mentioned, it's like, no, don't get into a restaurant if you're not ready for that commitment. You know, you have to think these things through a little bit. Yeah. For Kirfatu, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Yeah. Um, what are the most important connections? Have you had, have you had relationships with other entrepreneurs or um, places that have been like, formative or very helpful in, in the company's growth? Yes, um, I know that um, there's a few local companies that um, we've ha we have a good relationship with. Um, we've taken advice from them, you know, we've talked to each other, especially at events. When you're at outdoor events, other than your customers, all you have is your um, next door person who's also a vendor. So you kind of like share ideas. Like um, I know we just bought a really expensive um, tent mm. and that's because we had that idea from another vendor at the Hilldale's Farmers Market. Cause we had, we're always buying tents, but it's, it just gets ruined like so fast. But then the next door vendor had a really good tent. So upon conversation, we're like, you know, hey, where did you get your tent? And then he gave us the site. Oh, we got it from here. And then from then on, we started communicating with that company. And then finally, we have our own tent, um, you know, designed with our name on it. So it's like things like that, that we didn't know where to go. But talking to other vendors, not just a tent, but you tend to learn a lot of other things that you can use in your own business. Nice. So it seems like we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, I would love it if maybe some questions could come from the audience. I, we have little cards that you can write them down on if you have a question. And in the meantime, I have a question that I'd like to kind of give to everybody, which is just what is, what is your favorite thing about your work? What is the thing that, that makes you want to come back to it? I'm gonna say for me is that customers, just seeing them really, really happy. I mean, like the food we make is um, 
West African food. So to be able to bring that in American culture means a lot to us. We didn't know how people were going to take it, just but just to have people eat that and come back, give it a phone call or an email, oh my God, your food was fantastic. It just means a lot. And every time I get that, it melts my heart. And what I usually respond is like, oh, thank you so much. So that's my favorite part. I have to agree. I mean, that's my that's my my favorite part too. No, is is when you're when especially I'm sure with you too, like sharing cuisine with people that maybe or things that maybe people wouldn't normally have or haven't experienced, and you get to share that part of yourself, your culture, flavors, and and different things, and then seeing their excitement, seeing them come back for more, getting those emails. Like for us, like you know, we haven't been able to keep up with with our demand, and we've kind of kind of grew our uh, our retailers and the people we were selling to a little faster than we should have. And so, you know, when you're getting custom, their customers emailing us like, oh, where are your chips? Like, these people are out, you know, they're out. Like, where can we get them? And um, it's just, yeah, it's really just warms the heart when people just like love what you're creating and, and just are... Yeah, just huge fans of it. It's, it's great. I'm so glad that this is like a positive thing and not like a panic reaction, which is like, <laughs> oh God, I need to make more. <laughs> Um, for us, I think, uh, well, I have a, I have a unique perspective because, uh, I'm not in the tap room. So like my mm. one-on-one -on -one with people is limited to beer fests and, uh, the cognitive abilities of people talking to me at the end of a beer fest are <laughs> quite restricted. Different. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're a little different. Um, but, uh, I, uh, my favorite thing is that I get to interact with, uh, the, the stores and restaurants that I've known forever that I actually... I finally get to sell my thing to them, which is like for years I've sold everybody else's beer. And uh, I finally get the chance to do it. Like I did a beer dinner um, a couple weeks ago at a place called Tess in Milwaukee. Fantastic spot. Uh, they do really great beer dinners. But I got the menu and on the front it said owner. I was like, oh dying i was so happy about it. i was like yes finally <laughs> it was like a like sales guy sales guy sales guy owner boom felt awesome so that was that i i, I like i like that um i kind of i don't necessarily like worship like the notoriety i just like being able to talk to the people and get honest feedback too like if we we make two to three new beers a week if somebody doesn't like it cool we won't make it again but the fact is people are continuing to try it. And when a, when a, uh, a person at a bar and I get this feedback from an owner, they just pony up to the bar and say, uh, I'll just take the young blood. They don't even look at the menu. They don't look at anything. They just see the tap handle. It says young blood. There's no style. There's no nothing attributed to it. That is like, boom, we did it. We got it. We got it. So that's, that's my favorite part. Do you ever just overhear that and, and don't say anything? I did. It was awesome. It was so good. <laughs> uh, Ca great. Camino in West Dallas. It happened like a couple weeks ago. And then that person came up to me at a brew fest later and she's like, hey, you, you, uh, I, I always go to Camino and I just order whatever the young blood is. I was like, I was there one day. Woo! <laughs> Feeling good about it. So yeah, nice. that's, uh, that's the best part, I think. Cool. Industry. <laughs> Um, mine is also kind of customer related. I think for me, not having a culinary background, I've always really thought spices and cooking to be very intimidating. Mm. And, you know, my drive for this is creating a jar that you basically can take a spoonful of it, put it in your, you know, protein or your veggies, and then you have a chef meal. And to hear the feedback from customers of like, oh my God, I made this and it was amazing, but I made it. Um, that is probably the most rewarding part for me because that's how I felt when we first started playing with it. So for having customers come back and have that same experience is just like really awesome. Yeah. I love that you guys are making, or you have been, I don't know if you still are, um, but working out of bunkies. Yeah. So I love, you know, when people start talking about like people in Madison just coming to mm -hmm. bat and helping um, Teresa and Rashid from Bunkies um, literally are like angels. Um, they let us kind of squat in their basement. That was, <laughs> and we still are there actually. Um, but yeah, so we are working out of the basement of Bunkies. Um, maybe eventually we'll leave, but you know they bring food for us. You know when we're working. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's the Madison community is incredible. Just like that is a perfect example. So many people came to us and said oh my God, so-and-so told me you guys are starting this spice company. Can I have some? I want some. And then they shared it with their friends. 
and it just kind of grew from word of mouth. So yeah, the Madison community is absolutely incredible in that way. It's one of the things that I love most about living here, mm-hmm. truly, mm-hmm. is that kind of collaboration. So, and you, Brad, what do you love most? Well, I've always, I have a, a line I've used. I've sort of worked my way down the corporate ladder. You know, <laughs> I started I started at Oscar Mayer, went to Sargento, went to Palermo's, and and you know, the, in, when I'm in front of them, I don't like to. I make sure I take the good with me, and leave the bureaucracy behind. Yeah. Um, and you learn along the way. All right. And and working, you know, and what I've also done, the other thing I've done in my career is, I've had you know two careers. One in engineering, where I built facilities around new plants. Or products, all right. So I always had an access to products and marketers and whatnot, but I built the building around it and made the processes work for it. Then I got the ch- chance to go into operations or into marketing and and to do new products and actually build products and businesses. And and uh, you know, I sort of that's when I realized I like to create things, all right. So you know, as I as I my exit strategy from corporate America was to get into consulting, you know, and then start you know, and I do consulting with with them still. So that's that's one nice thing. But I really like working with the entrepreneurs. I mean, I've had 50 companies now come through my program. This year, we're going to have 60 coming coming through in a, in a combined program that we're expanding. And it's just the, it's just great working with them because, you know, they, they, they're, one, they're sponges. You know, you guys are just go, going at it. You know, what I've I've navigated through in, 30, in I say 35 plus years, you know, I can share with you. I've got people that I know that I can get in touch with them. So it's just making those connections and helping them realize their potential. Um, it's it's really for me. It's easy. You know, I can do this. You know, my wife wants me to retire, um, and I'm like, you know, I like what I'm doing. I really like what I'm doing. You know, but and it's it's just a lot of fun. And like I say, I get to live. And now I get to live vicariously through them. You know, as I see them. To the bottom of the ladder, you can uh, yeah. come on over to Youngblood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> I, 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 f- I found that uh, since since I I met Tara several years ago and, and interviewed her a few different times, the appetite for what you do just keeps increasing. Mm-hmm. The interest in the Food Finance Institute and the and the desire for that knowledge of how to how to build these new businesses it just mm-hmm. keeps getting more and more. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, those connections are vital. Yeah, well, it, it truly is. I mean, you know, everybody, you know, you look at, you ask the one question about money. I mean, I worked with a lot of families that have had money. I mean, yeah. you know, the Faluca family, the, the Gentine family. So they had access, right? You know, but then most of you guys don't have that access. You know, the, the way you get that access is by finding people, you know, talking to people, networking. Um, the, the good ones know how to do it, and they, and they get it done. And it, it, there is money out there and people willing to spend it on people like your, you know, your businesses. So this is a question from the audience. Um, I, I feel like all of you are relatively new in your businesses for the most part, but what advice would you go back in time and give yourself when you were first, first starting out, uh, if you could do that? Besides, don't do it. <laughs> uh, I'd like to go first on this one. I think it's uh, put an elevator in because um, our <laughs> Our brewery is in a basement, <laughs> and uh, all of the kegs have to be hand carried out of that basement, and it's horrifying. Um, <laughs> however, both of our brewers' arms are completely jacked. So, boom. There you go. <laughs> I think I need another second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna have to say, um, just um, talk to the professionals first. Don't just jump into it just because you're thinking about it. Talk to a professional. That's important because that can save you a lot of time of um, on not what not to do. So. Yeah. This is a really hard question. <laughs> um, I think it's hard for me because we just started in November of 2020, <laughs> so we haven't even met our met our one year mark yet. We're still quite newbies. Um, so perhaps in a couple of months, I might be like, "Oh, I wish I could have done that differently." Um, but just general advice is don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, I have a very friendly relationship with our person at DATCAP because I ask him questions all the time. And when we talk to other, you know, people who are creating products, they were like, oh, you're like friends. And I'm like, they, they should be your friend. Um, so I don't have any lessons learned, but as far as advice is ask questions. Um, and that has really saved us in a lot of ways. Nice. Is um, really, really generous. Um, 
I found that out. They're really generous, very helpful. So that's really important to um, build a network of people. They will give you advice, help you mm -hmm. anytime you need it. Um, and I guess I, I guess I would say, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help, and don't. Um, be afraid to hire help sooner because <laughs> I mean yeah because there's yeah because like I said earlier we kind of we've overcommitted a couple times in in certain areas and you know it, it's it's it would be it would have been easier to either hire help or just communicate that hey we're going to need some more time because there's nothing like not being able to meet your customers demands if they're if they're you know it's 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 not a good feeling to have so yeah ask for help or hire help sooner you know I think that would be important nice do you have any advice for your early Well, yourself? I guess, you know, especially I'm considerably older than everybody here. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I always tell people, you know, always remember this too will pass. All right. Mm. So now if it's bad, it's going to get better. All right. If it's really good, it's going to get worse. <laughs> all right. All right. So, you know, what you have to do is just understand that there's cycles and everything you're going to be doing. You know, don't, don't, you know, you get hung up on one, on the, you get going on the high, you go do, you might do something not wise, all right? You go on the low, you might not do something wise like you quit, you know, like don't do that. I mean, figure your way out of it, all right? You know, and I, I've had a number of times throughout my career, it's like, oh my God, what am I gonna do, all right? And, and you solve it, you know, you work your way through it. It's never as bad as you think it is. Do I have time for one more question? Yeah, okay. Um, so I would love just to offer everybody here the opportunity to shout out somebody this, Mad, the Madison community is full of people with great hustle and great ideas and I just on on the theme of all boats rise um, if there are folks that have been uh, essential to you or helpful to you or who you just love what they're doing I want to give an opportunity for a shout out right now I'm going to give a shout out to Bonnie's Walls um, she's she's really great we met her like a couple of years ago at an indoor event but I'm giving her a shout out because she made me Christmas cookies last year, even though I didn't get to eat them. <laughs> yeah, my family ate it before I was able to try them. So, but I just want to give a shout out to her. She's really great. Say her name one more time. Barney's Balls. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I've kind of already shouted out a couple of people. So, um, and besides Christy and all the all the make shop people that I'm excited to work with, I'd just like to give a shout out to David Rodriguez because he's been <clears throat> he's been supporting us a lot, and and you know, and we've played an important role, I guess, in his restaurant. Or he's made us an important part of his restaurant with like su us supplying him tortillas and everything for his for his restaurant, and. Um, you know, he has offered to be of more of service to us, whether if we need access to capital or we need other things like that. And so, um, you know, I'm just really grateful for grateful for him and just this community of people that are in Madison that are just so so helpful. So it's it's been amazing. Nice. Uh, I'm gonna say thanks to everybody who's uh, who's purchased from us and bought from us and helped us can beer uh, all day long at places uh, at different locations. Uh, Chris over at Trixie's, uh, he he helped us out right away. Right when we started, um, the people, the different breweries that have helped us out, uh, Vintage Carbon Four, Wisconsin Brewing Company, um, the the awesome guys over at uh, Working Draft, um, and there's many many more. But uh, just helping us stay alive, allowing us to do pop up beer gardens and stuff like that, beer nice, selling yeah. when you know people couldn't come in and drink our beer. Uh, and then um, the Food Fight Group, uh, we made a beer for them, um, and we're donating uh, donating some money through that. Uh, Hustle and Flow is actually the name of the beer we made for them, which is hilarious. Um, and then um, just different people willing to do events, like we have a Baroque uh, and State Line collaboration Oktoberfest coming up. So a lot of stuff like that. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely the people like our diehard customers who keep coming back. I don't know if we would have made it without them. Um, but I do want to give a shout out to Bunkies, of course, for helping us throughout this and giving us great advice. Um, but also the folks at Orange Tree Imports. Mm. Um, they were the first local establishment to reach out to us. Um, they actually reached out to us on Facebook. We didn't even have a wholesale form. Um, and just said, I love what you're doing. We want your products. And, you know, they've been working with us ever since. Um, but then also the ladies at Landmark Creamery. Um, again, another great idea came from them. They said that they tried our spices and they wanted to actually create a custom cheese with them. 
Um, and so these partnerships were really crucial for us because it made us thinking about what more we can do versus just bottling spices. And so I really need that cheese. Yeah. <laughs> you can get it at the West Side Community Farmers Market. <gasps> Ooh, pro that's a great tip. Thank yes. you. So it's my shout out. Well, I tell you what, I, I really love, like I said, working with the entrepreneurs and, and Tara and I have been working together forever, you know, with my accelerator at, 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 at FAB and now at, at, the, at the university. And so, you know, t and Tara now is going off to Iroquois Valley. So my shout outs to Tara for doing what she's done to get this thing going for the Food Finance Institute, getting the, you know, the vision of what we've been working on on this accelerator going. So that's great. And then the other one is my wife for letting me do this, you know, because she, like I said, she really would appreciate it if I retired. Um, but uh, I really don't want to do it just yet. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I so appreciate all of you. Um, I know you're all so busy, and it just means a lot that you're willing to do this. So thank you. We would like to take another moment to thank our sponsors, whose financial support helps make Cap Times Idea Fest the important event that it is. Special thanks to our presenting sponsor, UBS, the Burrish Group. They have been a major sponsor since the very first Idea Fest. Major sponsors include Health X Ventures, Exact Sciences, and Quartz. Co-sponsors are Madison Gas and Electric, Godfrey and Kahn Law, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Epic. Our Friends of IdeaFest sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Madison Community Foundation, University Research Park, Cargo Coffee, Doc Smokehouse, and Forward Theater Company. Our media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal, Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Again, we thank you for your support and for making IdeaFest 2021 a huge success. <laughs>